Today we have this absolute beast of an integral courtesy of subscriber badly organized genius. So yeah, thank you for the monster and wow, this is this is really one hell of an integral. It's the integral from zero to infinity of sine x times the natural logarithm of 1 plus the cosine of x divided by x times the cosine of x. And it seems perfectly justified to go all out with this one. So we're going to solve it using Feynman's trick. And for that, I'm going to have to define an integral function i of some parameter alpha. And we'll define it as the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times the natural logarithm of 1 plus alpha times the cosine of x divided by x times the cosine of x dx. So the target case is the case for alpha being equal to 1. And because applying Feynman's technique to solve an integral is essentially converting the integration problem into a differential equation problem, we need some initial conditions to solve it. So a useful case over here would be i of 0, because in that case we have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x times the natural logarithm of 1 divided by x times the cosine of x. And we know that log 1 is 0, so we have i of 0 being equal to 0. And that's going to come in handy later. So now that we have a plan, we differentiate the integral function with respect to the parameter alpha. We switch up the order, and we now have the integral from 0 to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of sine x times the logarithm of 1 plus alpha cosine x divided by x times the cosine of x dx. And because we're differentiating partially with respect to alpha, all the functions independent of alpha are treated as constants. So what we have left is the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x times cosine x, and the derivative of the logarithm term is the reciprocal of the argument, so we have 1 plus alpha times cosine x, and because of, the, because of the chain rule, we have the derivative of 1 plus alpha times cosine x turning out to be just cosine x, integration with respect to x. We have some lovely cancellation taking place, and this means that the derivative of i with respect to alpha is the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x times 1 by 1 plus alpha times the cosine of x dx. And when I said we're going all out on this, I was not joking. We're going to need another insanely overpowered integration trick, and that is Lobachevsky's integral formula. And there are two forms for this. Both are concerned with the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x divided by x times a function f of x dx. Now, depending on the behavior of the function f of x, if f is pi periodic, that is x plus or minus pi equals f of x, then the integral sorts out to that from 0 to infinity, uh, 0 to pi by 2, that is terribly sorry about that, of f of x dx. But what if there is a sort of negative periodicity involved here, an or an alter alternating periodicity involved here? What I mean by that is f of x plus or minus pi equals negative f of x. In that case, the integral becomes that from 0 to pi by 2 of f of x times the cosine of x dx. So taking a look at this function, we realize that we have neither case, which is a bummer. But we can fix that and actually get both cases by expanding using the conjugate. What I'm trying to say is that the derivative of i with respect to alpha can be written as the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x by x times, in the denominator, we have 1 plus alpha times cosine x, and we want to expand using the conjugate, the conjugate being 1 minus alpha times cosine x. So on multi multiplication, I get 1 minus alpha squared cosine squared x, and in the numerator, I have 1 minus alpha times cosine x. Okay, cool. Now, separating the terms in the numerator and 
multiplying the sine x by x term and using the linearity of the integration operator and all of that stuff. I have sine x by x times 1 by 1 minus alpha squared times the squared cosine of x minus the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x terribly. Sorry about that. Sine x by x times alpha times the cosine of x divided by 1 minus alpha squared cosine x. Okay, so that means for the case of the first integral, let's call this one I1 and the second one is going to be called I2. The second bracket was looking a lot better. This one, this one looks slightly better only. I'm fine with it. Anyway, the important thing is that for the integral I sub 1, the function f of x involved here is pi periodic. We have the squared cosine of x and cosine of x plus or minus pi equals negative cosine x, but the square takes care of the negative sign, which means that we have the first case of Lobachevsky's formula. That is, we have a pi periodic function, meaning that I1 would be the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of dx divided by 1 minus alpha squared times cosine squared x. Whereas the second integral, we have exactly the same denominator, but in the numerator, like I said, the cosine of x obeys this equation, which means we have the second case of the formula. So we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the same function f of x in i sub 2 times a cosine term. So we have alpha times the squared cosine of x divided by 1 minus alpha squared cosine square x, terribly sorry about that, dx. Math chads and chadettes, we really arced out with this integral. Anyway, it's time to evaluate i sub 1 and i sub 2. So for i sub 1, we have integral 0 to pi by 2 dx divided by 1 minus alpha squared times the squared cosine of x. And when I have trigonometric functions like these in integrals, I often like to expand using squared secant functions. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And the benefit of that is that substitution, a very specific substitution, becomes quite easy to see. So we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the squared secant of x dx divided by secant square x, which can be expanded as 1 plus the squared tangent of x minus alpha squared because the, square, uh, because the squared cosine and squared secant functions cancel out. Meaning that we have the structure integral 0 to pi by 2 of secant square x dx divided by tangent square x plus 1 minus alpha square square root squared. So that means if I make the u substitution, that is letting tangent x equal to u, which implies that secant square x dx equals du, and that gives me the integral from 0 to, as x approaches pi by 2, the tangent approaches infinity, we have du divided by u squared plus the square root, the square of the square root of 1 minus alpha squared which is pretty easy to evaluate. This is your standard arc tangent structure, meaning that you're left with the reciprocal of square root 1 minus alpha squared times the inverse tangent of u divided by square root 1 minus alpha squared, with the limits being 0 and infinity. And in the limit as u approaches infinity, we just get a pi by 2 term. Oh, terribly sorry about that. So uh, there we are. So as u approaches infinity, we have a pi by 2 term, and as u approaches 0, we get a big fat 0, which implies that i sub 1 equals pi divided by 2 times square root 1 minus alpha squared, and now for i sub 2. Now i sub 2 looks like it can be extracted from the knowledge we already have of i sub 1. So let me first expand using alpha and we have 1 by alpha times the integral from 0 to infinity of alpha. No, wait, it's the integral from 0 to pi by 2. Sorry, I work so much with integrals from 0 to infinity. Anyway, so we have this divided by 
that thing. And now let's introduce a couple of negative signs. Okay, so far so good. And now I'm just going to add a zero by writing one minus one. So that gives me negative one by alpha times the integral from zero to pi by two of one minus alpha squared times cosine squared x divided by the same thing, which means we have some wonderful cancellation minus the integral from zero to pi by two of one minus one minus alpha squared cosine squared x, which we recognize as i sub one, and we already solved that. Meaning that we have the first integral here sorting out to pi by two. So we have negative pi by two alpha, two negatives canceling out, giving me pi by two alpha times the square root of one minus alpha squared. And this is what i sub two evaluates out to. Now that just looks bloody gorgeous, doesn't it? Anyway, it's time to piece everything together. So we have i sub one and i sub two. The first integral evaluating out to pi by two times square root one minus alpha squared. And the second one, here's a negative sign. So we have positive sign pi by two alpha and negative sign pi by two alpha times square root one minus alpha squared. So that's the derivative of i with respect to alpha completely in terms of the alpha parameter. So we integrate with respect to alpha to recover back the integral function. That gives me on the left hand side, i of alpha, and on the right, I have pi by two factored out. And what I'm left with, first I have the integral of one by one minus alpha squared, which is the inverse sine of alpha. One by alpha gives me a log alpha term and the reciprocal of alpha times the square root of one minus alpha squared is the inverse hyperbolic secant function, the negative of the inverse hyperbolic secant function, that is. So that means I have a plus sign now and all of this stuff plus the constant of integration C. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm tired of saying inverse hyperbolic secant function, so I'd rather just expand this in terms of natural logarithms. Well, that's one reason, and the other reason being we have a log alpha term here anyway. So this thing can be expanded as the logarithm of 1 by alpha plus the square root of 1 minus alpha squared divided by alpha. And we have a log alpha term. So combining these two using the laws of logarithms gives me i of alpha equal to pi by two times inverse sine alpha plus log, the alpha multiplies out, meaning that we have one plus square root one minus alpha squared plus the constant of integration c that I now have to determine using my initial value conditions. Recall that i of zero was conveniently equal to zero, meaning that we have zero equal to pi by two times inverse sine of zero being a zero plus log of one plus one minus zero. So that gives me log two plus the constant of integration. And all of this implies that c equals negative pi by two times log two. Okay, cool. So all of this means that I finally have the form for i of alpha. i of alpha sorts out to pi by two times inverse sine alpha plus log one plus square root one minus alpha squared minus log two because I factored out the pi by two term meaning that my target integral i, which is the case for alpha being equal to one, is pi by two times inverse sine pi by two, inverse sine one that is, is pi by two, plus log one plus zero, which is of course log one, which is a zero, meaning that we have pi by two times pi by two minus log two which is a pretty cool result indeed. I hope you enjoyed. Wait, before you go, everything in the store is 15% off using the code MATS505 until January the 31st, 2024.
I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.